Cool. We are now recording. So thanks again, everyone, for attending the first Managed Monthly meeting. We had a uh, technically our first one when we were at Summit, and I spent some time talking through the slide deck and about a little bit about Manage itself. But I think this is the first one we're doing on Zoom. So super excited to to dive into the uh, into the agenda with everyone. So uh, thanks a lot for adding to it over time. Um, I, I guess we have no accomplishments to talk about. I'm hoping that we uh, we will in the future, and we can use this. Uh, this uh, meeting to kind of celebrate some of those wins and awesome stuff that we shipped. If we hit our OKRs in the future, uh, it would be great to, to use this as a, as a celebratory moment. But, uh, but I think Dennis, you had like the first, uh, the first <laughs> comment under concerns or questions. Yeah, I was just trying to um, understand like the definition of what is a, a deliverable likely to or anticipated slippage. So issues that are likely to slip. So I was just trying to figure out like what, um, what, is, what does that entail exactly? And uh, you answered that in the, uh, the, the doc, but I don't know if you want to expand on that as well. Yeah, I mean, just more context is that in the, we have the, uh, in our pre, in our kind of like planning cycle that starts off with like product kind of meeting with EMs and trying to do like a pre-planning session. And the goal of that is to basically come, product comes with, you know, a list of features and, you know, feature related issues you want to ship. And then EMs kind of, and we kind of collectively represent bugs and tech debt. We kind of come together on like what exactly we can ship. But since we're doing that in the middle of the release cycle, you know, there are some stuff that might slip out of the current cycle and influence our, you know, the, the future planning session and our capacity. So that's what that list is. It's just like, you know, if we haven't started something, our confidence is obviously lower than it'll actually get into it. And so it's just for me and for product to say like, oh, you know, we, we don't want to kind of overcommit. We want to make sure that we leave a little bit of room in case, you know, important things slip. Because if they're worth working on in the in the current release, they're probably still high priority for the next. So that's all that that's all that conversation is. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, I was just trying to get understand the detail of and you you covered it, like what hasn't been started, what is in dev, what's in review, and like the different gradings of what would be like different levels of anticipation, I guess, for different levels of slippage. So cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And Liam, do you want to talk about everything else issues? Yeah, absolutely. So um not sure this is in the right section, what would it been sort of concerns or questions. It's more about since I joined, I guess one of the things that I found more challenging is trying to understand the remit of the team. Um, and I think that's basically because obviously when the split from platform happened, which had kind of a really wide scope and I think it was very much was the sort of the everything else team. Um, I think Create got quite a, um, a clear scope in terms of what they're responsible for. And I think managed it as well, but I think there was there's quite a lot of things that maybe don't fit necessarily nicely elsewhere. And one of my feelings was that a lot of those issues were, were coming to manage. I think they are, but it also seems like that's happening with other teams as well. Um, so it seems like there's a, lot, there's a lot of issues at the moment that we're just not able to categorize particularly well. And I think a lot of them are around Kind of not necessarily technical debt, but technical improvements and, and things like that. And the main point of putting this on, on the uh, agenda was just to point people in the direction of the issue that has been opened recently. And um, there's a good conversation going on um, there at the moment as to what we do to, to kind of solve this going forward. Um, I think short term, we're going to try to, um, it's, it's going to be encouraged that the PMs try to kind of evenly distribute some of these issues, some of which I guess will naturally fall into teams, some of which won't. Um, and then longer term, I think there's going to be a discussion as to whether we have a specific engineering team who who takes on the seemingly sort of everything else issues. Um, no clear solutions as to the long term plan yet, but certainly have a read through that that issue because I think it's um, it is definitely worthwhile doing so. Yeah, I feel mixed. I mean, I think one of the suggestions floated in the issue is actually creating like a specific team for it. I'm personally against that. Um, I, I think that the main problem is that someone there, it, there needs to be like someone that represents like the priority of these kind of like everything else issues. And I think that who the team that actually works on getting it done, um, you know, we can, we can kind of load balance between the teams. Um, I, I just, I think that that's the main, the, the, making sure that the prioritization is understood and being re well represented is like the main problem in my mind, because if this falls into the crack, like it's always going to be secondary to like all of the important stuff that managers like working on right now. That is that there's a clear owner of like, that's, you know, unless it's some, you know, massive security hole, like one issue is like this fuzzy kind of, how do we prevent SQL injections in the future? And there's no clear like proposal in that issue. 
But if there's someone that's actually like Kathy from the security team who's like responsible, you know, that, for pushing like that forward and saying like this is something that we need to solve, then at least the EMs can say like, okay, let's 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 look at you know our roadmaps who might actually be able to pick this up and then just say like create you're gonna you're gonna pick this up and 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 move move this forward. So I think that that's the real thing that's 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 a gap in my mind. It's like who represents the priority and that that I think should have clear ownership. Yeah, and I think that was a point that Dawa made on that issue. It's almost where, where everybody owns something, then often nobody owns it because yeah. you kind of have that bystander effect. So I think that's much of what the conversation in that issue is around. So if nothing else, it's quite an interesting read and I don't think we're close to kind of coming to that long-term solution yet. But um, all input is, of course, um, going to help us get there. Cool. Cool. Uh, so, James, I think you're next on the SAML issue. Yeah, so, so this was an issue where um, adding a simple button originally, um, but then it was suggested that we should disable it when there's stuff in the form, um, because otherwise people might lose the things they've entered. Um, so after a UX review, it started to need front end, and it's, I managed to write that in JavaScript, but it turns out that we're not allowing jQuery anymore. So um, that's stalled on that. Um, and also, it, most jQuery is easy to rewrite, but the tooltips part would need to be moved to view. So um, that uh, I'd need front-end help on that, or I'd need to learn view so I could have uh, done that from the start. Might um, this be a really good 201 session? Yeah, that, like so, something on how to get started in view in our code base that'd be really useful because so I've, I've built some apps of my own in it but it's very different to um the way we we structure things be happy to jump in on a call with you if you want to go through that were you, just a quick question um were you told like in the review that you shouldn't use jquery or um uh, like what what is behind that thought uh yeah so in in i uh the first part review someone said we're, we're not using jquery as much anymore um and I, I think I could have proactively uh, sooner kind of asked, like, what's the best way to, to approach this? But um, in my mind, it was originally similar to some other code. So I kind of took, used that as inspiration. So an another thought is that, um, like, uh, similar to how we use Rubicop and rules that, and exceptions, if we go back and add exceptions to the places where we've used jQuery, and that will kind of make it more obvious that that's not something we encourage anymore. Yeah, but if it is yeah, only I mean, a button and it's only if there's already existing jQuery or existing JavaScript, it's better to use vanilla JavaScript if that is also possible. If we have, if we have some sort of jQuery plugin there, I think it's a very pragmatic and very, very usable choice there. Uh, I will have a look at it because we shouldn't do just view for the sake of view. We should be pragmatic and move stuff forward in there and yeah, I will have a look. Cheers. Sorry, do we, do we have any guidelines in the handbook that outline kind of what we should be doing in this space? What kind of like best practices are? I think we have a few different pages. So I kind of, I looked for that and I kind of saw style guides on, on how to write the jQuery. And so I, I kind of took that as a, yeah, it's allowed. Um, but it's there's diff different areas, um, so I I feel like I might have seen something that suggested the the other thing when I went back and looked, but I'm not sure where. Yeah, we've we're working on a new front end guide as well. We still have the existing one as well, so we haven't merged all that in. But we do generally discourage the use of jQuery. But if we're working in something that's already ninety percent jQuery and you have to make a one line change, then it's like prefer to do vanilla. If you have to use jQuery, then that's okay. But it's not crystal clear, but, but the, generally we're kind of away from it. The, the other thing related to this is part of the thing that made me not um, push me away from views slightly is I need to rewrite the views that we'd kind of um, done on before. Um, so that might be something where we don't want to um, do a, a backend feature then as we start to build out the front end and make it more complicated, we don't want to have to rewrite things. So maybe, um, yeah, so yeah, but in this case, I think what Andre, because I had now a look at it, what Andre meant was less, uh, he, he wrote that view might be also an option, but in that case, it would be, the main option would be vanilla JavaScript so that we can uh, simply skip jQuery. And perhaps Dennis uh, or Martin, you can jump in here to get this vanilla 
it shouldn't be too hard. I think it's only two files and we simply need to change some queries here or there. Yeah. And then we can get rid of jQuery. That would be awesome. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be really useful. Um, I think the jQuery tooltips is the only bit where, where it might be a slightly more. Yeah, I think it makes yeah. sense to, to use vanilla JS or even jQuery if there's a lot of vanilla and jQuery stuff on the page already. So I was in a similar situation with one of my issues where I decided to use jQuery just because all the other parts of the page were written in jQuery and it didn't make sense to just introduce a new feature in you there. Yeah, we'll take sure. Just send an, maybe you can post an issue and then we can look, have a look at either Dennis or me and check how we can write it in vanilla JS. Cool. Cool. Um, moving on. So uh, Andreas posted a, a uh, item here about ambitious planning. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's aware there was a merge request that was merged that talks about ambitious planning to the product handbook and the direction page. And the TLDR is that instead of aiming a hitting 100% of deliverables, our aim will be to plan aggressively so that we actually aim at about 70% of our deliverables. Um, so we will intentionally be kind of, you know, over, you know, overshooting this kind of stuff, the, the number of deliverables that we hope to, to deliver in a release. Um, as a result of that stretch may be going away um, in favor of either stack ranking or using prioritization labels. Um, I'm personally in favor of the latter for reasons that I articulated in the issue, but we'll we'll see kind of see where that conversation goes. But um, it looks like the stretch label may be deprecated in the very near future, and we'll just you know overstuff deliverables and then prioritize those somehow, and then use that to educate like the order in which we get things done in a particular release. So um, we'll see where that conversation goes. Would, would you already target uh, for this release the uh, ambitious planning of seventy percent? I, I think I think yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say this next release, uh, the seventy percent number is uh, would be the goal. I think that you know the only thing that's TBD is kind of how we order the issues across GitLab. But on this team, we've been stack ranking using the board, um, which is the next is the next item but yeah Liam would you agree with that Liam, definitely, definitely cool. agree cool. cool does that work for you as well Tim cool cool uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about release uh, so like we just mentioned the like we've talked about using this board kind of for stack ranking issues. And the one thing I just wanted to mention is that we, I, I changed the link on our manage page so that it actually points to this board here. And this board, which I'll just share super briefly, uh, is the prioritized label, which now only has like, so there's 19 issues in backend, 16 in front end, 11 in UX. And the idea is that like, it was super unmanageable for me because before there was like 100 issues in backend, it was impossible to stack rank them all. But now the, I, the scope for this board is basically what we're working on the current release and what's coming up in the next release, and that's it. And the stack rank should only be about 20 issues in each particular list. So you know, if there's ever a question like what our near-term priorities are and like what the order is, it's always this link, top issue is most important, kind of moving on down. So this at least breaks down like the issues that we think are the most important for us to kind of tackle in the next release, and then the ones and the order in which we should kind of consider doing them. In. The point, you know, the, re, the um, deliverable plus milestone should always represent like the, the, the aggregate number of issues that are, you know, marked as deliverable and that we, you know, hope to hit 70% of um, at least. And uh, that board should kind of define the order in which we do it. In. And again, like that might change and, you know, evolve into like P1, P2 labels or, or whatever. But for now, it, the board is a single source of truth, and that stack rank kind of tells you what the priority is. So, and I think Liam had a question about you know comfort level there. Yes, yeah, so definitely. Just a continuation, really, of, of the points that you've made there. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone was kind of happy and understood what the new kind of prioritization process looks like, and kind of what you should be looking to do when it comes to pick up uh, picking up new issues. 
Uh, I know previously, obviously, we used to do, I think, probably more work up front in terms of weighting the issues. And I think often, uh, at least it seems the case when I joined, we used to assign a lot of the issues to engineers up front. Um, and I think generally we're, we're not doing that now. I think there's some issues where maybe some work has already started or it makes complete sense to assign them. Um, but I think the, the, sort of the, the method we're moving to is having kind of just a, a long prioritized list in, in terms of the backlog. And then when you're ready to pick up something, you sort of pragmatically pick up something that's, if not at the top, then very near to the top. Um, and then obviously that, that coincides with what Jeremy was saying about the um, prioritization label. Um, and I think in the doc as well, where I've uh, highlighted issue boards, that takes you through to a board that I'm using, which I found quite helpful. Um, and I think generally that's probably the, the same filter that everyone else is using. But I just wanted to make sure that that was clear and, and everyone understood and we're not going to be kind of picking up issues that, that maybe aren't a priority due to kind of me or maybe Jeremy not, not communicating clearly. Yeah, and one goal was to kill the spreadsheet. Like the, the spreadsheet that I've been using, I think that I'm going to continue to use that with Andreas to help our own planning process. Again, like, you know, so we don't have like 500 issues that have the prioritized label. It's impossible stack rank. Those will live, that list will live in my spreadsheet. But, you know, the, pri the immediate priorities of what, what we should be working on this release and then the next release should live on that board. It should be very clear. It should be like just a handful of issues that are very easy to kind of like to crock. Um, so I'd love to get feedback here or a and async on like whether or not that makes sense. If people find it confusing, if we can improve it, um, would love to get some feedback. It'd be a shame to lose that Google Sheet code, Jeremy. It's awesome. You need to get that <laughs> printed and framed. Oh God. My, my <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure all the front enders would be horrified at my JavaScript capabilities. <laughs> Uh, the, the only problem that I see and, and I've seen in the past is simply with dependency management because this means that there might be uh, the first front-end issue is number four. Uh, Backend has only capacity for the first three. What happens then? Uh, that's a classic problem in such uh, uh, circumstances. And sometimes the other problem that I see so that uh, most probably we will keep assigning issues simply based on the priority list, but we want to uh, assign issues from the front end side at the beginning, uh, is also what I see sometimes, is especially if you get new people on board, and number three is a eight super hard one, then of course this person will not pick up the number eight and the super hard one, but then rather an engineering manager should have the feeling, okay, that person is capable of doing that stuff, or that person needs some uh, has already super advantage knowledge about exactly that screen, so perhaps number three is better for that person. So that's that's something that uh, yeah gets complicated with a rather with a list of pickup. Yeah, <laughs> so so I, I agree with you, and that's kind of why I like the the P one P two method a little bit better than stack rank because you know if you have a situation in which you have a junior dev or a new dev and you know, there, you can at least look at like the, the P1 issues, maybe there's four of them or something. And we can say like, well, it doesn't make sense for them to pick up, you know, smart card or some, you know, hard authentication problem. But there's other P1 issues that are really important that they can kind of dive into. And it's very easy for us to make that decision, that, you know. Whereas in a stack rank, you know, it's just top issue, which you should technically always pick up, you know. Um, and then you kind of have to say, well, maybe it's second, maybe it's third, and, you know, it gets a little fuzzier. Um, and then if you have the P1, P2, if there are dependencies, you can prioritize like the, you know, the, the first issue that needs to be done, whether it's front end or back end or whatever, like first and make sure that that gets picked up first by that team and, um, and so forth. So I, 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 that's why I personally like that. And I think that the dependency issue gets reduced a little bit if you have separate issues for each one, which this team has been doing, like we've said, specific product discovery, backend, frontend issues. And if there's backend that needs to be done first, then that goes to the top of the list or they get to P1 or whatever. So that gets picked up, you know, sooner rather than later. So I think that, you know, these are tractable problems, but I agree with you that, you know, we just need to be thoughtful about them as we move forward. I think it's almost when we when we assign issues, or the only reason we would maybe assign issues is to solve some of those problems. Mm. Um, so it might be if there's if there's an issue that's absolutely urgent and it's related to subscriptions, then because of the urgency, we may just automatically assign it to to Ruben because he has knowledge in that space. Where if it was less urgent, the preference might actually be to have an opportunity to do some knowledge sharing and and basically somebody else 
pick it up as, as and when they get around to it. Um, I guess that's something that we have to be sort of pragmatic with. And if anyone notices that you're finding it harder to pick up issues or to understand issues because they're not in your sort of usual domain area, then obviously, yeah, just, just stick a note in, in Slack and we can, we can figure that out. But at that point, if we know that it's like going to go to someone that has that, that domain knowledge, then that would already be pre-assigned, right? Exactly so, that. Exactly that. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Uh, so you know, on that note on 11.5, um, again, feel free to kind of take a look at the board, spend some time looking through the issues, kind of thinking about it. But at a high level, I wanted to share what that's kind of looking like at the moment. Um, so on the back end side, like the, the priorities that I've talked kind of talked about from a product and customer perspective that remain really high are billing and the smart car off. Smart card because there's just, it unlocks a lot of business in our public sector again. And then on billing, there's just, we have lots of uh, improvements that we need to make uh, to kind of help our customers answer questions and manage spend. So those remain like some of the biggest priorities. You can see like the smart card and uh, backend support for some billing improvements is kind of top and number one and two in the list. But I think that right now, the biggest thing that we're facing for 11.5 is just a lot of bugs that we kind of need to crush before we can really move on. There's, I think, I think seven or eight P2s. Six of those bugs right now on the board are security issues. So that's kind of you know, being a serious headwind towards more, uh, more progress we can make on back end. So we need to burn some of that down. Um, on the front end side, like we're working on some really exciting things. Uh, Chris Parasini worked on some design, wrote some really awesome improvements for billings or license page for self-hosted and .com. So we'll work on, on getting those in along with like this new help menu, which will help uh, improve our navigation to a big degree. And then some awesome, awesome, awesome um, improvements to make the pro make GitLab more lovable and project, project improvements, tool tips, and the better activity feed, which are all really exciting. Um, on the UX side, we're going to keep moving and we're gonna keep in, uh, working on billing improvements. I think Chris is going to continue to work on like customer portal stuff um, and how we can improve the billing experience and payments for customers. Um, DevOps score versus cycle time is something we're working on. And then also I think uh, Matei might be working on a really, really awesome personal dashboard feature that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. So that's kind of things at a high level, um, you know, we're, we've been prioritizing the billing work and we still have a lot, we still, you know, it's, we're going to start making like the first improvements, start implementing the first, uh, first improvements there and then continue to tr make progress on billing and smart card and a lot of these kind of UX UI improvements for, uh, to make GitLab more lovable. So that's kind of how 11.5 is looking right now. Feel free to kind of take a look at what's on the board right now and that if there's things that are missing or if you disagree with the, with the, with the ranking, Please, uh, please let's talk about it. Cool. Over to you, Sanad. I was in the middle of adding it. Um, <clears throat> yes, so going forward, um, we should plan on delivering the QA automa automation test, the end to end test, uh, along with the feature. Um, so, the, in the same way that we deliver documentation. Um, uh, when, with our merge requests. So uh, I will be reaching out to developers who are working on, on their respective features uh, to help them understand the, uh, uh, the, QA test, the QA automation test base if they are not yet familiar with it. Um, and I will be also helping them uh, contribute to it. Uh, James and I had a session on, on, on SAML end-to-end uh, -end tests and um, I did post a video on the group channel as well. Um, so yes, just calling that out that we should keep that in mind while planning um, our f um, the delivery of the features. So Sanad, what's the what needs to happen? What what do you what do we mean by keep things in mind? Like, is there um, do we need to make this like a like a definite part of our kind of a definition of done when it comes to new features. Um, I, I, I know that quality, there was an issue in quality where we were trying to debate like how test plans kind of fit in. I don't know. I don't recall if that issue kind of went anywhere, but um, how, how do we, how do we write this down? How do we formalize it? I guess um, so we do have, uh, we do have a page. Uh, I'm going to post it over here in the right here. Hold on. 
Jesus. So, so there are some updates to uh, the test planning process and how the, uh, the test plan fit into uh, the release. So coming back to your question, we, we, have, to, we have to integrate uh, the automation tests as part of the, uh, it should be a deliverable in the same way the documentation is a deliverable for a feature. So when I said we have to plan ahead, I meant that we have to keep in mind that uh, at the end of the release, we are also supposed to have the end-to-end -end tests in place and the merge request is in place. How, how are you sort of determining the scope or depth of the end-to-end -end tests that need to take place on each issue? Is that a conversation with the engineer? Is it a conversation with product or maybe a stakeholder or a customer? It will be a conversation with the uh, with the engineer, and uh, and the test plan would be would be there to guide the end to end test. So um, a, a decision would be made in, in collaboration with the test engineer uh, on, on on the scope of the uh, end to end test. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Cool. So when does that conversation take place? So does that does that happen kind of during feature development where we're talking about developing the test plan in parallel with the feature? And then at the end, uh, we kind of make that a yeah, like like you said, doc, like documentation, a condition of of our definition and done and getting this merge in production. So but, the test plan would the test plan would be um, would be created at the start of the release. And uh, the conversation would be like ongoing uh, throughout the release. Uh, the test plan would have the uh, the expected uh, expected tests or the coverage that would be needed. And as the uh, feature is being developed, um, the test engineer would uh, continuously monitor what tests are being added. And at the end of uh, near nearing the end of the release, um, um, I think that's when that's when the end to end. QA end-to-end -end automation tests would be added. Um, but again, um, it would be a high-level test and, uh, and something that um, the QA test engineer and, uh, and the, and the back-end engineer or whoever is working on the, uh, on the feature would decide together what needs to be covered. What kind of features um, do we expect? to do these end-to-end -end tests for? Because it's something like SAML or LDAP where there's a lot of setup, it's really useful to make sure the configuration, like everything will work in reality. But for a lot of smaller things, like uh, it's not as big a thing. Exactly. Um, we should not have interest in tests for everything. Like not every, feature, not every small feature that we develop or, or deliver as part of the release would have end-to-end -end test. Uh, for those that would require end-to-end -end tests, we would um, we would have a conversation around it and then decide yes, we need we need something more here. So is this something that we just pick up in review? Like we'd say this is missing end-to-end -end tests, and, and at that point go back and then for the future get in the habit of uh, planning for them. But or yeah. Um, if I, I don't think I understood your question correctly, um, but for the feature that we are, we are developing as part of the release, uh, for the larger features that would warrant an end-to-end -end test, uh, we would discuss throughout, uh, we would discuss it um, during the release um, and then decide that we need to have an end-to-end -end so, test. So maybe um, a, a label or something on the issue, no. so when we have, no? <laughs> yeah. The, the, Label, just adding, uh, sorry, uh, did, did you mean a small feature as in label? No, so, so if we um, decided that this would need end-to-end -end tests, would it help to have a label that said this, this should have end-to-end -end tests? And so that when a developer picks it up, even if it's a community contributor, they know that they've, they've kind of got to add end-to-end -end tests. Yes, that kind of, uh, of makes sense and it's a good idea. Um, yeah, we, we can think about adding a label for um, for something that would require for a feature that would require an end-to-end -end test. Yes. 
Well, can we make it just part of like the MR template to like ping, I don't know, uh, you know, Remy or Mech or someone on quality or to some, for, for, the, for someone to say like either you need to have someone sign off and say, this doesn't require and then tests or link to the test plan. And, you know, that, should, that needs to be part of, you know, of what gets merged. So that this check happens when you create the MR. I, I, I don't know. We don't, we don't have to discuss it here, but I, I think that, I think my point is, is that like, like that like James was kind of alluding to, like it would be helpful if there was like a specific check or mechanism or discrete way of saying like, this needs end to end testing. This does not need end to end, -to -end testing. Um, and that would be really helpful in helping us kind of like identify what we need to do. Cause I, it, it becomes, I, I would prefer it to be less of a, of a judgment call. There should be like a very discreet kind of way of telling. Um, yes, that is uh, that's something that we can talk about. And uh, um, how how about if we if if a feature has a test plan associated with it, then um, then we have then the developer looks at the test plan, and uh, the test plan would clearly say that we need an end to end test for this. If there's an so if there's an associated test plan. Uh, go go and look at the test plan. The test plan would clearly have uh, an indication of adding the um, the end to end test. Okay, um, that might make sense. I, I you know let's 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 talk about it maybe in an issue or in an MR to the handbook. Um, I, you know I, I think that, that that makes that can make sense. I'd be concerned about cases where you know you're really busy. The test plan doesn't you know isn't isn't available at that that precise moment, but you want to do it in the future, and then we. You know, in the meanwhile, it gets merged without actually without us like keeping track mm -hmm. of like the need for the testing. So, you know, that's why I think that something very lightweight and just like either a checkbox or a label or just something to say like this needs it. And then, you know, we either check the box or remove it when the test plan gets kind of like fulfilled. Um, that way, if we miss stuff mm -hmm. along the future, we can just like filter by, you know, needs test plan and then is open or something. And we can very easily see where we're missing coverage. Um, so I'd prefer something like really lightweight like that, but we can discuss it offline in like another issue or, you know, with the rest of the quality team. Yep, sure. Uh, thanks for bringing, bringing that, that up, by the way. And I do like the idea for, uh, of the label, um, but we, we will still discuss it. Cool. cool. I, I think an issue would be good because it would be good to get input from other teams as well. And even if they don't have something like this in place, then maybe they'll, they'll find it useful. All right, I'll, I'll add it to my list uh, for talking this through with the quality team as well. Thanks, Anod. This is, this is important, so uh, we just want to make sure we get it right. All right, thanks. Uh, that's it from me. Cool. On to OKRs. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about OKRs. Um, what we've got so far in the OKR page for the managed side um, was what you see there, sourcing team. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about OKRs. Um, Liam and Tim, does that kind of cover the OKRs that, are there any existing MRs or discussion that, I'm, that I didn't cover there? Or is that kind of what, what the status is, what's on the page? So we have overall for the front-end engineer, we have front-end OKRs. Um, and there are two OKRs who uh, are valid for a manage. So overall in the front-end uh, team, we want to hire two more managers and 10 more engineers. Uh, until uh, the end of the year. So uh, what will happen is that we are actually spreading them out uh, based on priority and I'm touching base as much as I can with all the different product managers and also the team members of each team to figure out when do we need or where do we need the, the next engineer the most urgent. Currently, I think with three front-end engineers, manages uh, has even the most uh, in one specialty. Uh, so let's see um, how this works out and how soon we will need another one. But at least definitely one more front-end engineer will come to the managed team until the end of the year, that's for sure. Um, right now, it looks like that we will even be able to fill all those positions in the next weeks. We have two already in offer stage, two more are in the final check stage. Uh, we have, I think, 600 more applications to go through for the other six. So I think we should be fine <laughs> to, to fill those positions as soon as possible and also to get 
with of all the interviewing that we that all levels in the front end department currently doing. So that's part of the manage uh, OKRs. And the other thing is that we um, uh, will have now the quality uh, the dashboards that quality has created about the the error budgets, and through them uh, we want to uh, uh, we want to count and keep track of everything that. Uh, was created on the back side uh, that falls into the error budget for manage. So we will have a board per front end for manage and figure out that we keep our uh, error budget. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm quite envious of, of those numbers on the uh, on the hiring side because we're not having quite so much luck um, from, from the back end, which I think everyone, everyone is aware of. I think there's various different reasons why and I think Tommy's kind of uh, been assigned a personal mission of, of figuring out how we can uh, kind of increase the flow coming in. Um, I think we've got about five candidates at the very start of the pipeline at the moment, specifically for manage. Um, so, so fingers crossed, um, we, we can kind of see some progress there. But I, th I think the, the number that Tommy was showing me yesterday, I think it's a, a, we're hiring pretty much about 1% of um, applicants that we screen. I think it's 1% or 2%. It's not a big number. Um, so kind of uh, the, the good thing there is we, we have data around this now and I think we're trying to use that to, to figure out where we need to focus our concerns um, to, to kind of pick some of those numbers up um, but I, I, I would you know I, I don't expect um, to be to be making any offers within the next week or two given kind of what the pipeline looks like hopefully this time next month I'll, I'll have some better news on that um, and then the other one was obviously around the um, sort of this specific team initiative um, which was specifically on the 201 session and, and the knowledge sharing. Um, and, you know, I, I think I, there was good feedback when, when we suggested um, taking that on as an initiative. I think it actually may have been Imre who said that it seemed quite an ambitious goal. And I think in part it, it is. I think, um, you know, if, if you look at doing 10, that, that's nearly one a week. Um, and I'm sure between all of us, you know, that that's not kind of to actually run that session maybe isn't a huge undertaking. If you want to get value from them, obviously we want the majority of the team to be part of those sessions. Um, so I, I think you know this, this is a great opportunity. I see James already made a, a couple of notes as to topics that we could discuss, um, and, and it would be great to see input from from everyone. And hopefully by the end of the quarter, I'll have some value to add there as well, and, and hopefully I can run one myself. Cool. Um, maybe we should open an issue on topics, and we can kind of drop. Yeah and drop these ideas in over time i will take the um I'll, I'll take a note to do that awesome perfect perfect do you have a link to um where you described the structure of these so, um and like is it to the rest of the team and like how would we go about that so i, I don't know if i understood i understood all the questions so i've got a link to the um the merge request effectively that we created to have the um to, ha to have it merged in which gave a bit more of an in-depth description as to what we're trying to achieve with the 201s um i can I, i'll certainly link to that and i can link to that on the doc i don't know if that answers all of the question oh uh, yeah because i remember you mentioning it somewhere like you said it could the structure could have this for 10 minutes that for 10 minutes but yes. i kind of forgotten the details i'm almost certain the mr covers that if it doesn't i'll i'll add it in um and, and i'll assign that or I'll, I'll link through to that on the doc Sorry, is this backend specific or is this for managed team? I just I just thought I moved under the backend bullet point. I was making sure. Yeah, I think this was actually a bit of confusion for me kind of going through the process because um, it was kind of the, the engineering manager's responsibility kind of as part of the process to, to kind of uh, work with the team to come up with what these, the specific OKR should be. I know across some of the other teams, there's kind of some backend technical debt issues that they've covered. I'm, I would actually encourage that we make this a team-wide initiative rather than back-end. Um, firstly, because it means that obviously there's going to be more contributors and, and more chance of, of kind of um, getting some of these sessions out there. But I think it will also help knowledge sharing. And I think the topic that you and James were discussing earlier in terms of, sort of vanilla versus view versus jQuery, um, I think you know, they're, the, they're the topics that will be really useful to be having as, as a team. Yeah, that's a good quote point though. Like I think 10 talks might be very aggressive if it's back end specific. And I don't know if we've ever done like a shared OKR between front end and back end. I would I, I would, you know, wonder if Tim would, you know, buy into the to that OKR. I'm I you know, I I'd have a hard time seeing him push back at it. 
but uh, I <laughs> better experiment. And on the other hand, I mean, the reorganization is going exactly in that direction. So why, why not start it already? Mm. Yeah, if it's less the OKR and more if this, this is useful, we should do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, exactly. And just to clarify, so is this something we do like a presentation where everyone kind of watching? Is that the audience? Yeah, I think so. So I think it's an open invite. I mean, if you're comfortable just doing it with the team, that's fine. If you think it will be useful to the wider team, so specifically in terms of, you know, how we address some of the JavaScript concerns, then you know, I'm sure like every team would could get some value from that. Um, so I guess what, as and when we come up with the topics, we can, um, can probably determine who the audience should be. Um, I had a really good conversation with Tommy when we come up with the OKR about the different types of metrics. I think he, he has a definition of kind of a, a lead-in metric and a lag-in metric. And I think the, the metric that I've created here is effectively a lead-in metric where it's quite prescriptive in terms of what we're trying to do. Kind of we're, At the beginning, we're saying this is exactly what we want to achieve as opposed to saying we want to see a result and then we fig figure out almost a journey to get there. Um, and I think the reason, so if you think about what we want the result to be, it's increased knowledge share and it's increased team collaboration. Um, and I think certainly the suggestion of having all of the team involved and you know, maybe it would even be great if Jeremy and, and I did a session as well in terms of, kind of the, the things that we're focused on. Um, then yeah, certainly the more the merrier. I think anything we can do to, to help kind of cross collaboration would be, would be useful. Yeah, I'm happy to do one as well. Uh, but the way that I've been thinking about these 201s, and you know, this is me in a vacuum, but if I were a developer and I was working on a, like an, an audit event issue or like SAML or something, what is a video that could live in Google Drive that I could just double click on, watch? You know, maybe there's some interactivity in it where there's psychic action to get hands on and like get a really good overview. But at the end of it, kind of have an, at least a very high level of like how that feature works in GitLab and how I might be able to dig into whatever it is that I need to work on. So like, obviously you won't be able to get, you know, a comprehensive view in 30 or, 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 you know, 30 to 60 minutes or whatever, but at least it gives me an overview of like, how do we track audit events? What table do we use? What methods do we use? What models do I need to worry about um, to at least get me started? So that's kind of how I've been thinking about it. Cool. Awesome. Sorry. Um, I, so I had the, 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 you know, like, you know, I, I asked when we should start the answers now, let's start soon ASAP. So hopefully we can create that issue, get to get something on the calendar uh, sooner rather than later. I think that'd be the goal. Um, there's one thing, so I think that there, I thought that there might be a features level OKR. I don't know if there's other OKRs lay, uh, going on. I know that Yov asked me for like the features that we wanted to hopefully ship in Q4 if we could ship nothing else. Those were the three that I provided uh, to him, so that might be appear, that might appear as an OKR at some point. Um, the last point that I had, and I'm going a little quickly because I know I wanted to make sure we get to show and tell. Um, you know, does anyone follow or care about OKRs, and how can we make these more valuable? I think that I would just love to see us like keep track of these OKRs, keep talking about them on, on a monthly basis in these meetings. So. You know, at least we can keep an eye on like our progress and kind of how we're doing. Because I don't, because as a, as a product person, like we don't really talk. We only talk about OKRs when we set them, and you know, kind of when we uh, when we you know push the hand the the the, the hand button, like what happened. But during the quarter, I you know I don't I feel like we we could we could talk about them. We can keep talking about them in this meeting. Um, I, I had this point here about uh, team vision page and then sharing with GitLab. There were just two links that I wanted to make everyone aware of. The one, first is the first, which you can see there under vision, which is kind of the page that we're using to kind of talk about the overall scope of the DevOps manage kind of in, in, within the DevOps lifecycle, what we hope to, what, we're, what our scope is, what kind of the vision is for what we hope to achieve in the future. Um, there's obviously content there that that page will continue to evolve over time. Um, and then we have the, obviously the team page, which is more kind of, you know, how we operate as a team, uh, kind of the process that we use in order to make that happen. So the first is the vision for like that stage of the DevOps life cycle. And then the second link is the team that actually gets us done, which is this, this group obviously. Um, and then how we kind of function and operate as a team. So if you haven't seen those links, take a look. You know, these are obviously open uh, to MRs and uh, I will continue to add to them over time. Um, and the last point was that manage, uh, there's an there's a, a issue there link. Manage is gonna start doing FGUs. Um, we'll, we're trying to figure out the date and when and get, get these on the schedule. 
But um, once that's done, we'll figure out a template and then we'll kind of uh, probably rotate presenting responsibilities um, in, terms of, in terms of that. I'm sure Liam, Tim, and myself will probably take a leading role in the first one. And then we will uh, we'll kind of hopefully rotate that around uh, on a monthly basis. So that is, uh, that's coming. All right, so show and tell. So if you're not familiar with the term show and tell, it's a very American centric term. And show and tell is something that you kind of do in elementary or primary school generally as you're a kid. And you will like, you stand at the front of the class, you show off something cool to the class and you tell people about it. And that is show and tell. Um, so I, 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 thanks a lot for, I'm going to turn, turn things over to Dennis. who's going to do a little bit of show and tell about some stuff that he's been, yes, or, or you cry, you're creating your presentations or we're all friends here. So, uh, so Dennis over to you, uh, would love to hear about what you're working on and, uh, and see a little, see, uh, see, see about it. So over to you, man. Uh, just for the record, I have not cried giving a presentations, um, get really nervous when I was a kid, but. I've seen that from classmates, so <laughs> not for everyone, I suppose. Um, cool. So first one I'm doing is just to set user status uh, in the modal. Um, just doing this one first because I have to fire up the uh, enterprise GDK for the group level project templates, which Ruben and I have been working on. So we'll just start off with um, user status. So, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, so previously, I mean, we just recently launched user statuses, right? And so right now the current way to do uh, to update or clear your status is to go through the settings uh, edit page. So um, I think the main goal is to make this more accessible. So you know, if you're in some random page of GitLab or to do's or whatever, you can just quickly change your status um, from where like wherever you are on GitLab. So in the user menu, you have this option here. Um, it actually displays your full status. Um, of, of course, if you have a longer one, it truncates and just shows in the tooltip. And um, you have the option to clear, edit, or um, yeah, just basically set your status here. So if I just remove the status, then just sets every um, resets it back. So if you're if you have if you only use it for like your out of office, then you can just go back and clear it. Um, and then you can same basic concept with uh, setting profile um, the profile settings page. So uh, you can just set your status and then. You can also do the whole um, emoji autocomplete within, set it, and you're good to go. One caveat that we have right now that we set up this follow-up for is that um, I'm currently re reloading the page just because we have to update the status. And to update, we have this issue in um, a number of places where we change some field and it doesn't update through the rest of the page. So right now, um, it's reloading the page just so we can update that in the, not only in the dropdown, but on issues and merge request pages or other areas where we display the current user's um, status. So that's something that we're going to continually improve. But for now, um, it's just a more accessible way of updating that. Then I'll pass it on to uh, Jeremy to, no, while I fire up the next GK. No, that's awesome. Or if there's any questions, by the way. Yeah, how does this look on mobile? Uh, great question. Um, it's not bad. <laughs> The flyout menu is a little weird um, with the emojis. Um, if I go here and edit status, uh, it's fine, I should say. <laughs> but there is some consideration with like having like a layer on top of a layer and selecting it. Everything still works, but um, you know it's just a little bit smaller. It's responsive, I guess. So. I don't know if that answered your question, no, but it's good. still functional, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Any, uh, any, anything going on under the hood that, I don't know, was, that surprised you or uh, anything, any like challenges you ran into on the way or was it all pretty straightforward? Um, it's the classic story. I think Tim's very familiar with this as far as my time at GitLab is where it seems very straightforward at the beginning, <laughs> but isn't. Um, because the code that we use to set the status in the profile settings page is a mix of Camel and jQuery and vanilla JavaScript. So kind of the same problem that, that James uh, was encountering as well. And so um, that required some, some finessing, particularly because it's easier for us to develop these things in view, especially because we have the GitLab UI framework with the new 
modal and tooltip components that we want to try to push forward. So getting that to work with, so basically just to provide more detail, this emoji menu is in jQuery. This, uh, and then getting this to basically play nicely, have this layer appear on top of the bootstrap modal um, required some changing in the code. So uh, it wasn't actually until this week that I was kind of doing that finessing. So um, it's, it's a, I think it's a classic case of as we're trying to move these things to, to view when, when necessary, or at least vanilla, that there is this integration that we have to do with jQuery or, or porting or refactoring to, to make it all work and also more maintainable. Because at the end of the day, we don't want to have to keep jQuery around. We want to get rid of it, right? So um, we'll continually find these areas in the product where we have to say, do we just update this line here or do we need to kind of bite the bullet and do a bigger refactoring? Um, but at the same time, not refactor just to, for the sake of refactoring, right? So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Any other any other questions? Cool. Thanks a lot, Dennis. That was awesome, man. Sure. Um, I'll fire up the EEGDK, -E um, but if you can stall for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, so the one thing I wanted to talk about and thank everyone for, so we had three respondents to the September pulse check. So thank you to those three people. Um, if you didn't fill this out, shame on you. Um, so I, I just wanted to say thanks and then also kind of run through the, the results real quick. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of discuss them at a high level. We have only eight minutes left. So I'm going to create an issue for all of for the, the, the interesting bolded points that I bolded. And hopefully we can kind of discuss them async and then see how we can improve. Um, so things we're going, you know, there's a lot going well. Um, one person kind of loved to see us deprecate the uh, the Google, the, the my crazy, insane Google sheet for GitLab issues. So hopefully the board is like a step forward there. Um, stuff that we can improve at um, was like maybe a team call where we could not talk about work style stuff, but more hanging out in nature. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I would love to see us do more there as well. Um, struggling at the transitions between milestones, MRs to review, issues to wrap up. It's chaotic sometimes. Um, planning a bit further ahead, possibly. Um, I would be keen to, to, dis to discuss that and see how we can improve there. Um, second bullet point was about identifying and solving problems and having issue slip. Um, trouble with the scope of issues when back end and front end are, invo are involved. Um, you know, I'd love to discuss of ways that we can improve there as well. Like we already split out like back end and front end to try to reduce that, but like there are always dependencies that you know may or may not kind of be, be obvious, and you know things get picked up different times. So definitely, uh, definitely keen to improve there. Um, it's lost on how the meet, how the team is kind of meeting the goals for the iteration release, or what the confidence level is meeting the goal. Um, stand up bot which is still you know to be configured um, I'll poke that issue again but there's there's probably other things we can do there as well which we can discuss async um, any suggestion for manages OKRs for Q4 uh, I thought it was interesting that someone says I don't understand the current ones so we can obviously we should make these clear so that we're all if we, we we have no chance of hitting our OKRs if we don't understand what they are so we can definitely make these clear and hopefully the ones that we set forth will be uh, will be clear um, and then there's some great suggestions there on other things that we can we can be doing as well. Um, issues making time for user onboarding, overhauling pages that haven't seen much love in years. I couldn't agree more. I would love to know if there are specific pages that we're really kind of keen to that we feel like need some need some love. I have some thoughts in, in my mind of pages I'd love for us to get to, um, but always you know, prioritization is always always hard. Um, and then this that issue that's linked is, is, is a security issue that we are planning to tackle in 11.5. Um, I think the idea of having like a, a general pool of issues that any team can just kind of pick up if they have spare time might be a really good one to kind of make like stretch to like not totally eliminate stretch, but maybe make it like GitLab wide, especially for those kind of plumbing type issues. I think that's kind of, that's a really interesting idea. Um, so, you know, the, uh, thanks again for everyone that kind of that, that shared their thoughts. It was super helpful. Um, and I would, uh, I, I don't know if it's worth doing this again, but I, this was, this was really great feedback and I, I really appreciate it. So we can, I'll take it. I'll, uh, I'll leave things there for now and then we'll take them into a, into an issue for more discussion, but thanks a lot. Does, does everyone understand now Q4 OKRs? Awesome. 
yeah, please, 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 please say no if they're not clear. Like, if there's things that we can do to make them more clear, like, they should all be, be super crystal clear. Um, and hopefully, you know, as things get added, they will, they will not get any muddier. So, like I said, we can't hit them if we don't know what they are. So, thanks. Over to you, Dennis, maybe? Yeah, GDK just finished <laughs> doing its business. Um, I, was a little, I was just going to fire... Um, Sorry, I was just going to screencast the loading screen for a while, or at least talk about the project labels, but um, it's all fired up now. So uh, the other thing I've been working on for this release is the front end for the group level uh, project templates. So I think it was 11.2 we launched, or 11.3. One of the recent releases, we launched instance level uh, project templates, and you can define that in your uh, admin area. But something that I think is much more useful is to define it per group, and you can select a subgroup. Uh, for um, you know, creating templates within a given project's namespace. So the way this is going to work is um, still need to. Oops. Well, I can't think I can demo that. But what I was going to say is that you can go in the groups edit page and define it there. So for every group that you're in, um, you can uh, define a subgroup that you can use as a source for your project templates. I was also working on moving that in the settings page, so that's probably why that's not working. But let's just pretend that didn't happen. And so when you create a project, um, uh, you can go, you're in the blank project. I just clicked something else. Awesome. Uh, so when you're in the project create screen, you have a tab for creating from a template. Um, we'll see if it switches my page. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so you can go to create from template. And originally, we just had built in. And then we have custom, which will now be renamed to instance. And then we have group uh, for the group level templates. Now, if you're entering the project create page from just the uh, general top level uh, navigation menu, then you can see all of the different subgroups. But when you select a uh, template, it will go to that main uh, group's namespace, but then you can change the namespace within that group uh, if you want, but you can't go from like H9B in this example belongs to H H5VP. I can't put this under um, Twitter or uh, whatever, any other group. So from here, you can preview it, it takes you to the repo to look through it, and then you can just use template. Then you go on your merry way to finish the rest of the project details, and then you can create the project from there. Um, and that's group level project templates. Uh, I've been working with Ruben on that. And so, yeah, any questions for this one? Uh, I just want to mention two things. This is like really, really awesome. There's a, like, this is, this, this is going to solve problems at GitLab. Like we have, we need these templates for like the account management team who like they set up, temp they set up a separate project for every account that they manage. Now we can just templatize that and then make that really easy. But those are, Obviously, templates that we want to live at the group level, we don't want them to live at the instance level. So that's super. That's super awesome. And then other customers who typically work with like uh, contractors or external co uh, customers really often, and they set up like bespoke projects for each of them in like their their project or customer group or whatever. Um, they can just simply like templatize these and then make their lives just really really easy. So really awesome for you know it's going to really help our users. It's really great. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention to Martin though is that now like the like the the the, the snowplow tracking that like he's been working on are now it's immediately out of date because we just added like stuff to the project page. So Martin, I guess for context, has been working on like adding snowplow click tracking to the project creation page. And then now we now this this new functionality is gonna be untracked. So i maybe we need to think about for new features, um, making sure that click tracking gets added along with those features, or if there's a way for us to include this in the tracking that's being pushed, uh, I, you know, we we should consider how that happens because you know the, he, he's do, he's doing awesome work on on the on the tracking side, and now that pay, it's going to be out of date when this ships. Yeah, I would. I, would, I mean, we can talk about analytics uh, in a separate topic or issue. Uh, I would venture to say that it probably may make sense as a checklist item for when you're creating the issue or the merge request of basically asking yourself, does is there anything here that needs to be tracked in terms of feature or events? Uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah, anyways. Yeah. I think that applies to most of the new features probably, right? Because we might want to add kick tracking to all the new stuff as well at some point. So I think the checklist is a good idea. Is there a handbook page um, describing how to add tracking and everything about it? Um, I think not yet. 
Um, but that's definitely a good idea to add something there because it's, it's, it's a straightforward process, but you need to know how to do it. And at the moment, it's just documented in the code, so we should definitely add a guide there. Perfect topic for knowledge sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's absolutely. a great idea. That's a great idea. Cool. Thank you so much for the demos, Dennis. That was awesome, man. It's, uh, it's really exciting stuff. All right, we are over time. Um, the only thing I wanted to, I will mention is please share your feedback about the monthly meeting. There's an issue there uh, linked on 6A. Um, you know, if you have ideas to make this better, if you thought this was a giant waste of time, like please, you know, feel free and unfiltered in your in your feedback. So, thanks a million. This was awesome, um, and we'll uh, we'll leave the rest for uh, for discussion in Slack and uh, and async. But uh, thanks everyone. Thanks, team. Cheers. Cheers. See you around. Bye -bye. Have a nice one.